we are in Senegal, at the end of the 1880s, where the French colonizers are facing fierce resistance from a tough young king, La Diongon Lata Diop, who for 25 years, is their real nightmare on the battlefield. However, fate can be cruel. In October 1886, La Dior was defeated and disappeared from the scene. The French colonizers believed that victory was finally within reach, that resistance was broken, and that their domination was indisputable. In part, they are right, as they now seem to control all of Senegal. The armed resistance faded with the death of La Dior, giving way to a policy of assimilation aimed at culturally transforming the Senegalese people into a carbon copy of white French men. Yet an extraordinary man emerges, defying all odds and overthrowing colonial oppression. His name resonates like a cry for freedom, Chak Omadou Bamba, or Sorain Tauba. He embodies resilience, determination and an unwavering faith in his people's struggle for freedom. Following in the footsteps of Semori Touré, Moba Dayakuba and Omar Foti Utor, he took up the torch of West African resistance, making it peaceful and cultural. But, it was far from easy for him, as he would be subjected to all kinds of privations and trials for more than 30 years, and yet, he would never give up his cause. How could a peaceful, non-violent man succeed in defying the French colonizers and resisting their persecution for so long? This is what we are going to discover together, through the incredible story of Chak Omadou Bomba's resistance against the French colonists. A story of stubbornness in the face of adversity, love for faith and commitment to the preservation of Senegalese culture. Fasten your seatbelts, as this story will take you on a breathtaking journey through time and space. Islam does not belong only to the Arabs, it has spread rapidly in West Africa. Arab scholars roamed the desert on camels to teach religion to the people of the region, establishing Quranic schools everywhere. The expansion of Islam in West Africa began under the Amorovids, who were Baba rulers ruling parts of North Africa and Muslim Spain between the 9th and 12th centuries. They played an important role in the spread of Islam in West Africa, especially in the Tekro region, located in the Senegal Loop. At that time, Senegal was a diverse place, made up of many tribes, some practicing pagan religions and others being Muslim. These tribes were led by different tribal leaders. Before the emergence of Chak Omadou Bamba, Islam had already taken root through groups such as the Fulani, the Tuareg, as well as revolutionaries such as Moba Dayakuba and El Hadj Omar Futi Uto. They promoted values such as equality, justice, dignity and pride in West African society. It was in this context that Omadou Bamba was born, around 1853, in the town of Mbakbel, in northeastern Senegal. This town was established by his great-grandfather Moharem back around 1780. At the time of his birth, Senegal was a place where different cultures and governments coexisted. Although Chak Omadou Bomba's ancestors have Futank origins, he grew up in the Uolof culture, establishing a special bond between these two groups. His mother, Soknamim Dayara Buso, was a Fulani from Golora, renowned for her great religious piety and respected throughout Senegalese society under the nickname God's Neighbor. His father, Moma Anta Selimbak, was a marabou of the Kaduriya Sufi Brotherhood, one of the oldest in Senegal. He held the important position of Kodi of the Kingdom, appointed by both Moba Dayakuba and Damon Ladio. His father's role was to handle civil, judicial, and religious matters, including resolving issues such as marriages and inheritances. From an early age, Omadou Bomba showed a keen interest in religious devotion. He preferred to follow his father's religious practices rather than play with other children. During his youth, he devoted his time to the study of Islamic sciences and teaching this knowledge to others. During the time of the Conqueror Moba, Omadou Bomba's parents, as well as many inhabitants of Bale and Jolof, migrated to Solum with Moba. After Moba's death, many immigrants returned to their home areas. Omadou Bomba's father went to Kea with Damon Ladio, while Omadou Bomba, his uncle and his family stayed in Solo. There, Omadou Bomba continued his apprenticeship and would be involved in various aspects of Islamic theology. When his education was well advanced, he joined his father who had settled in Kaamadu Yolo, the capital of the Kingdom of Kea. The Damon Ladio had a great affection for Moma and Tasoli and had appointed him as his trusted advisor. However, Moma had no interest in the king's wealth or power. 
His relationship with the king was motivated solely by a concern to protect the interest of his family. This is why, although he is at the disposal of the Damo, Muma has decided to create his own village, Bakkeya. This was all the more necessary as Muma was a teacher, and teaching could not be effectively carried out at the royal court. The village of Muma was located near the Damo, which made communication easy and fast. During his time at Kea, Omadu Bomba continued to study Islamic sciences intensively and shone in all religious disciplines. When her father noticed her exceptional skills in literature and religion, he gave her teaching duties. Omadu Bomba taught the lessons to the students in his father's absence and carried them out successfully. After his father's death in 1883, Omadu Bomba was about 30 years old and would now fully commit himself to a spiritual quest. He severed all ties with political leaders, including Ladio, and turned to Sufism with renewed devotion. Some of his relatives did not accept his rise to prestige, because he came from the same background as them and they did not want to be dominated by him. Their jealousy manifested itself in verbal and physical attacks against him, forcing him to leave the main mosque he had built and found a new one. This new mosque became busier than the first, which increased hostile feelings towards Omadu Bomba. In addition to the hostility of his relatives, he also had to deal with the hostility of local leaders. These leaders had friendly relations with his father and wanted Omadu Bomba to maintain these relations, but he refused. His refusal was misinterpreted as contempt on their part, and they even mistakenly thought that he despised his father's attitude towards them. In reality, Omadu Bomba was sending respectful warnings to his father, urging him to distance himself from the rulers, as he believed that their prestige in this world could lead to problems in the hereafter. His father acknowledged the correctness of his warnings, but stressed that his interest could not be safeguarded otherwise. In the late 1880s, Czech Omadu Bomba's growing influence raised concerns within the colonial administration and rivalries among some traditional chiefs of the Bale, who feared that their authority would be challenged. At that time, the French troops faced fierce resistance led by a young king named Ladion Gon Latadiop, who posed serious problems for the French army on the battlefield. In addition, Ladion managed to convert several traditional kings and their followers, raising the prospect of mobilizing a large military force, such as Muslim leaders such as Omar Futi Uto, Mobo Dayakubo and Seymour Touré, who had posed real challenges to the French in the past. Unfortunately, these leaders had all been defeated due to the military and technological superiority of their adversaries. Cheikh Omadu Bomba's reputation was such that crowds flocked to him in search of advice, help or healing. All who came to him, whether teachers, the sick or others, were assured of receiving his affection and unconditional devotion. Even Lad Dior, the national hero of Senegal and the last king of Kea, had humbly confided in the sheikh and received his prayers before dying under the bullets of the colonial army in 1886. To consolidate his faith, Omadu Bomba founded two cities, Jerusalem, the abode of peace, and Tauba, the blessing, the latter being particularly important to him. He chose Tauba as his spiritual center after having a vision of light during a prayer under a tree. Omadu Bomba was engaged in a concept of jihad, but it was very different from the traditional idea of holy war. For him, jihad meant primarily non-violent struggle and inner transformation. What was revolutionary was its openness to everyone, regardless of social status. Members of his movement were called murids, which basically means students, or seekers of God. In Sufism everyone was welcome, including slaves, local griots, and people of all backgrounds. Omadu Bomba also encouraged his followers to pursue professions to support themselves, considering it essential to lead a fulfilling spiritual life. The sheikh used to tell his disciples, work as if you would never leave this world and pray as if you were going to die tomorrow. Even though the king of Jolof, Abri Ndiaya, encouraged Omadu Bomba to take up arms against the French, he refused and continued to preach nonviolence. However, this unconventional approach raised concerns among colonial authorities and local chiefs who feared the challenge to social hierarchies. In 1889, French Governor Clement Thomas attempted to dissolve the movement, but Omadou Bomba's followers resisted. Persecution ensued, forcing the Murids to migrate to Tauba. A few years later, thanks to the complaints of Marabous and traditional chiefs jealous of the Murid's success, 
the colonial administration ordered the dispersal of Taba's disciples and the sheikhs enthroned by Omadou Bomba. After several restrictive measures taken against Chaik Omadou Bomba, he was arrested in Jewel on August 10, 1895. At this moment, Chaik Omadou Bomba's life took a decisive turn, as he was actively persecuted by the colonial powers in addition to continuing his peaceful struggle with his pen. Despite this persecution, he remained faithful to his nonviolent resistance against the French authorities, and he clearly expressed his commitment to this cause. At that time, Omadou Bomba's only fault in the eyes of the settlers was that he was a popular religious leader who recognized only God as his only master. During his captivity, his followers were ready to take up arms to fight the whites, but Omadou Bomba ordered them not to do so. He explained that he was the only one who could fight without shedding anyone's blood. He asked them to return home, assuring them that he would be back soon. At that time, his followers could not have imagined that seven long years would pass before they saw their spirit guide again, and many of them even thought they would never see him alive again. Yet, Omadou Bomba had an unwavering conviction that he would overcome all these hardships. Once arrested, French authorities transferred Chaik Omadou Bomba to St. Louis, which was the colonial capital of Senegal at that time. On Thursday, September 5, 1895, he was summoned before the Council of State of St. Louis to be tried. The director of political affairs at the time believed that Omadou Bomba secretly aspired to become the real leader of Bale, and then of Jolof, through trusted persons. He expressed the idea that Omadou Bomba was actually a jihadist, like other Muslim leaders of the time, and that he should not escape their control this time. The aim of the authorities was to put an end to his resistance once and for all. During the trial, Chaik Omadou Bomba performed a symbolic prayer of two rockets in the governor's office before addressing the council. He affirmed that he would submit only to God. With this prayer and his determination not to bow to the demands of the colonizers, Omadou Bomba began his passive resistance. During this trial, the Privy Council also summoned other religious leaders to compel them to sign statements denying the existence of God, the Prophet and the veracity of the Quran. However, Omadou Bomba refused to sign such declarations and reaffirmed his faith in the oneness of God. In retaliation, he was thrown into a cage with a ferocious, hungry lion in Ndiaye's Jardin d'Essays in St. Louis. The intention of the settlers was to physically kill him to get rid of him. However, the lion, instead of attacking him, became docile before the sheikh, who gave him bread and dates that he had on him to eat. Omadou Bomba has always maintained his principle of harming no one. The Colonial Council therefore considered three options to resolve Omadou Bomba's case once and for all. 1. Physically eliminate it. 2. Keeping him under house arrest in St. Louis. 3. Exile him to a place where he would have no chance of survival. In the end, they chose exile, counting on the weather conditions to weaken Omadou Bomba and his influence. After his trial, Omadou Bomba was sent back to Dakar, where he arrived shortly before sunset. He was put in a house, but as he was about to break his fast and pray, an officer came to pick him up and took him to a dark, hot, damp cell that smelled bad. The conditions of detention in Dakar, especially in the current camp of Diop, were very strict and difficult to bear. The sheikh understood that this was a trial that God had decided to inflict on him, and he chose to show patience, satisfaction, and gratitude to God, as this could prevent even greater misfortunes. Nevertheless, the French authorities continued to view Omadou Bomba as a major threat. A month later, on September 21, 1895, he was boarded a Brazilian ship named Ville de Panambuco, bound for the jungles of Gabon, a place where convicts were often sent with the hope that they would not survive. However, before he embarked, he didn't even know where he was being sent, until someone came to tell him of the arrival of a new governor who had not yet had contact with the locals. That's when he learned he was on his way to Gabon. The governor's envoy advised him to write to the governor to prove his innocence and ask for his release. However, as he began to write, Omadou Bomba suddenly changed his mind and informed the governor's envoy that he could not continue. Indeed, he had received a command from God not to accept the request, even though the envoy insisted on his release. At that time, Gabon was a dangerous rainforest where anyone who resisted settler rule was deported and kept in total isolation. 
This had been the fate of freedom fighters, such as Seymour Touré and many others, who had perished in that forest. This is why the French had opted for exile rather than execution, fearing that an execution would make Omadou Bomba a martyr, which could have strengthened his cause. Cheikh Omadou Bomba lived seven long years in exile, completely isolated from his family, friends, disciples, and his beloved city of Tauba. For five of these years in Meomba, he was practically left to his own devices, without shelter or food, exposed to the dangers of ferocious beasts and the unforgiving climatic conditions of the equatorial forest where it rains almost non-stop. Even the hardest and strongest soldiers succumbed to local diseases and the dreaded bites of tsetse flies. The prisoners endured a brutal and inhumane sea voyage under the hatred of the guards. Those who survived were then crammed into inhumane conditions, often dying from disease, ferocious animal attacks, or simply from the inability to adapt to the climate. The objective of the colonial authorities was clear, to eliminate Chaik Omadou Bomba. However, despite all this suffering, he never gave up his faith. During his exile, he wrote poems dedicated to the Prophet Muhammad, his guide and master, claiming that his only weapons were pen and ink, which he used to combat the arrogance of white settlers. Omadou Bomba has never advocated violence, preferring to fight against the enemy within, the vices in all of us. He saw his exile as a God-ordained mission, contrary to the views of the colonists, who hoped that his remoteness would diminish his influence in Africa. Moreover, at the time of the trip to Gabon on the same boat, he was miraculously forced, according to oral tradition, to pray on the sea because he was praying there, and Omadou Bomba absolutely does not intend to miss his daily prayer hours. So he threw a prayer rug that appeared on the surface of the water, so pious was it. On his journey to Gabon, he even miraculously performed his prayer on the sea by unfurling a prayer mat on the surface of the water, as he was determined never to miss his daily prayers, showing his deep piety. Once he arrived at his destination, Omadou Bomba faced a nightmare. The French authorities were determined to get rid of him. On an island where he was staying with soldiers, he had to bear to see them playing, drinking, and smoking in front of him, although it made him uncomfortable. One day, his enemies placed him in a narrow passage and unleashed an angry bull trained to kill him. They thought that the bull would crush him, but miraculously, the bull died suddenly in front of him, thus preserving Omadou Bomba, thanks to the assistance of the angel Gabriel. Omadou Bomba endured so much hardship and mistreatment on the island of Meamba that he would later declare in his poems, there are events during my exile that I will never reveal out of respect for my lord. In addition, during his stay in Gabon, he maintained an important correspondence with the Guinean resistance fighter, Semori Touré, who was also deported to Gabon. When Semori Touré died from endemic diseases, Omadou Bomba performed the prayer for the dead in his memory from Lambarin in Gabon. He also found Samba Lao Penda Ndiaya, a former king of Jolof who was also exiled in Gabon for five months. Although Chaik Omadou Bomba's exile was initially planned as permanent, several events will work in his favor. Chaik Sidia intervened on his behalf with the colonial authorities. In addition, Chaik Ibrahima IV, a fervent disciple of Chaik Omadou Bomba, managed to convince the Senegalese deputy, François Capot, of Chaik Omadou Bomba's innocence. This MP has pledged to rehabilitate Omadou Bomba after his election. Moreover, since Bomba's departure from Senegal, the revolt of the disciples or Tolibs had led to a drastic drop in groundnut production, jeopardizing the interest of the bourgeoisie of St. Louis, the capital of Senegal at the time. Finally, after seven years of exile, Chaik Omadou Bomba's exemplary and peaceful behavior in Gabon finally convinced the French authorities to bring him back to Senegal on November 11, 1902. On the same day, the ship on which he had departed arrived in Dakar after a 15-day sea voyage. His return to Senegal from exile was a powerful moment, and he was stronger than ever. The mere fact that he survived this period of exile was considered a miracle in itself. He was greeted by his followers and cheered by the crowd, as many thought he had passed away. After his return, he began to attract even more disciples, perhaps even more than before his exile. People came from all over to join him, to satisfy their needs or to congratulate him, attracted by his growing fame. However, the French authorities had stepped up their crackdown on any Muslim religious leader who could attract followers or hold any form of power. Omadou Bomba was under constant surveillance, 
as the French still saw him as a threat to their authority, in part because of rumors and his occasional displays of defiance of worldly power. In addition, jealous individuals crept in among the Shaker's visitors, and even before he returned home, they expressed their concerns out of jealousy, highlighting what they perceived as signs of potential unrest among the Shaker's followers. As the number of his followers increased, his opponents became more numerous and active. Provocators managed to sow doubts about the Sheikh, to the point that a group was sent to arrest him. Yet the French continued to keep a close eye on him, viewing Omadou Bomba as a threat to their growing authority. Rumors fuel this perception, as sometimes he dares to openly challenge the powers that be. The jealous creep in among his visitors, seeking to sow discord. They exaggerate what they see as signs of potential trouble. Just six months after his return from Gabon, the colonial authorities were again worried by the crowds, and Omadou Bomba was arrested again. This time he was exiled to Mauritania, escorted by 150 skirmishers and 50 spahis. These soldiers were tasked with burning the village in case the sheik hid weapons there. However, this exile, which lasted four years from 1903 to 1907, was very different from the previous one. In Mauritania, Omadou Bomba was surrounded by his Sufi disciples and was respected. His followers continued to follow him, even in Mauritania, and some wanted to organize a violent revolt. However, the sheikh objected, saying, I do not hope for the support of any friend, nor fear the aggression of an enemy, I have submitted myself entirely to God. He even opened a school in Mauritania to continue his mission of spiritual education. It was there that the Muridia Sufi order was officially recognized, according to the belief that Omadou Bomba had received the vision of this order from the Prophet Muhammad himself. In April 1907, thanks to his irreproachable conduct, Omadou Bomba finally obtained his return to Senegal, thus marking a turning point in his life. In Senegal, Chaik Omadou Bomba was forced to live in different places under surveillance, first in Luga and then in Diabel. However, the French authorities eventually realized that he had no intention of fighting them. At that time, the Sheikh's followers were determined to join him, traveling for months on end between Mauritania and Senegal to visit him devoutly. They brought with them precious gifts. It was much more than just a visit, it was a deep leap of faith. The French settlers found it hard to believe that the sheikh's only concern was to pray to God and serve the Prophet Muhammad. Thus began the formation of the community that would become one of the most influential Sufi brotherhoods in the world. Yet the French colonizers struggled to understand that the sheikh's only concern was prayer and service to his master, the Prophet Muhammad. They could not believe that behind these pious gestures lay the beginning of a community that would become one of the most influential Sufi brotherhoods in the world. The last years of Omadou Bomba's life remained intense. His ultimate goal was to preserve the spirituality of his society through education, thus creating a conscious population resisting colonial rule. His strategy was to transform society from within and peacefully. Omadou Bomba was committed to peace even in his last days. He reassured the French that he and his followers were not seeking to disrupt, but to work for nonviolence and spiritual transformation. In 1919, the French honored him by naming him a Knight of the Legion of Honor, but he refused to wear the medal, preferring to stay out of social affairs. Two years later, he publicly organized the commemoration of his exile, encouraging the Murids to celebrate through prayer, reading the Quran and sharing meals. Omadou Bomba died at the age of 74 on July 19, 1927, sadly without seeing the French leave Senegal. His legacy is immense, transforming the Murid Brotherhood into an influential religious, economic and social force in West Africa. Even after his death, the Murids, led mainly by his descendants, continued his spiritual lineage. Also, among his notable disciples, Chak Ibrahima Fall stood out for his total dedication to Chak Omadou Bomba. His movement called Bay Fall emerged under his leadership, emphasizing a strong work ethic and service. Thus, alongside the old brotherhood of the Tijans originating in North Africa and propagated by El Hajj Malik Sai in Senegal, the new brotherhood of the Murites created by Omadou Bomba emerged. In fact, the place where he was exiled in Gabon is now called Holy Mountain, and people regularly go there to meditate. In fact, the first thing he wrote and said upon his return to Senegal was, 
I have forgiven my enemies all that they have done to me for the love of God who has cleansed me from their accusation. Today, Omadou Bomba's predictions have come true. Tauba, the village he founded, has grown into a major city in Senegal, celebrating Megal every year in commemoration of his exile, attracting millions of visitors. Its peaceful impact endures, inspiring generations alike, both murids and non murids So we come to the end of the fascinating story of Chaik Omadou Bomba. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. For those who wish to support the channel, you will find our TPE page in the description. Thank you for listening, feel free to leave your comments, and see you soon for a new video on the channel.